Uh, first of all, I'm Bill McCloskey, and as Blaze indicated, um, for many years, I was the extension specialist uh, in weed science from the U of A, and I've worked on this crop on and off for, for uh, I guess, 20 years. Um, but uh, today we're going to talk about weed management in Waiuli, and I'm going to skip through my introductory slides. Um, let's see here. Because uh, a lot of it's been covered, uh, but I do want to make the point that uh, weed control in Waiuli is a challenge because uh, the seedlings, uh, here's a seedling on the right shown in the red circle surrounded by a sea of, of uh, little mallow seedlings. Um, it's not very competitive, it's small, and it's uh, relatively slow to germinate and grow. Um, and on the left is a, an old transplanted field, uh, older work from the 2000s, uh, showing uh, just a weedy, weedy field to make the point that um, that is one of the big challenges uh, to growing Waiuli. So, I thought uh, once we, as Sam indicated in his slides, um, you know, once we get Waiuli established and get beyond the first few months of growth, particularly when the canopy closes in the row, uh, we patrol, we control becomes quite a bit easier. And certainly by the time you, uh, the crop's been in the field a year, um, there's really not much weed management that's uh, needed, uh, provided you have a good stand without a lot of uh, gaps in the canopy. So um, really, my focus has been on um, how do we get through those first several months during establishment. I've been working, uh, as I indicated, for, with this crop for quite a while. Early on, we did screening and um, kind of got a sense of what herbicide chemistries would, would be compatible with Waiuli production and uh, identified some things that don't work. Uh, in the last several years, I've been working with the suite of pre-emergence herbicides um, shown here on the left. At this time, the only one of these for which we have a, a special local needs label for Waiuli is Pearl H2O. And as Sam indicated, we're working on um, several, several of these, uh, getting labels for several of these other materials. Um, we have looked at a, a, a lot of herbicide chemistries uh, related to post-emergence herbicides that we could spray over the top of Waiuli. Uh, right, right now, um, the, we have a special local needs label for AIM to help us control broadleaf weeds. And we have found that all of the grass herbicides um, are tolerated by, uh, by Waiuli and are, are going to be quite useful. And then finally, we've done uh, work uh, a little bit of work, just trying different uh, cultivation methods at different uh, crop growth stages. Um, basically, roller, rolling cultivators versus uh, a cultivator set up with uh, barring off discs, knives, and sweeps. So I'm going to start at the end and just show you a sequence of tactics for weed control um, to get the crop started. And um, then we'll talk about uh, how we collected data and, and what the data tells us uh, um, about these herbicides and why we feel we can use them to provide weed control uh, in Waiuli. So um, an important post-emergence herbicide, again, is AIM. It's Waiuli seedlings. Uh, Sam and Dave both showed you pictures of mature Waiuli plants with mature leaves that, that have thick cuticles, they're waxy, they're covered in leaf hairs. And because of that, we found that uh, Waiuli is very tolerant to all of the PPO inhibitor herbicides, all those burned down chemistries like AIM, ET, Goal, Chateau, uh, et cetera. Uh, but we focused on, on AIM. Um, when we spray small seedlings, however, the leaves are quite tender and it does cause leaf burning and necrosis um, on some of those leaves. We found that if we wait until Waiuli reaches the four true leaf growth stage, it can tolerate aim rates of one to two fluid ounces and uh, regrow from the injury. Obviously, as the plants get larger and those leaves get tougher, there is a lot less uh, injury on larger Waiuli plants. And because of that, um, 
we found that Wiley can tolerate sequential AIM applications uh, early season. We've also looked at both uh, using AIM both with non-ionic surfactants and methylated seed oils, um, and they they um, they are not really different in terms of the, the amount of damage they cause on those young tender leaves. We've also worked, uh, done quite a bit of work with the uh, grass herbicides, uh, cefoxidum, clethidim, and fluazifop. And as you might expect that with Waiuli being a broadleaf plant, there's no injury uh, from any of these grass herbicides at, at 2X the maximum label rate uh, and actually higher rates uh, beyond that as well. <coughs> so, a grass weed control between the pre-emergence herbicides, so particularly, uh, for example, with Prowl uh, and um, these post-emergence grass herbicides, um, we have a pretty good handle on that. <clears throat> we do have some gaps with uh, with other weed species, such as the nut sedges, um, and I'll come back to that point later. I do want to make a point about cultivation. Uh, it's going to be a necessary tactic. Uh, but, but it's hard to use early season because of the small size of the seedlings. Um, we found that the rolling, rolling times, like in a rolling cultivator, cause less damage to Waiuli root, uh, roots, uh, but is also less effective, particularly against grasses. The issue with it is it, you can bury small seedlings, um, and that's something that has to be avoided. When we use a cultivator equipped with um, Discs, knives, and sweeps. We've found that uh, you can cultivate uh, uh, too close and do enough root pruning that water stressed Waiuli uh, plants will die. And that's what I've shown in the pictures here. You can see the red circle. These plants had about 10 true leaves when we cultivated. Here you can see the width of the uncultivated band. These plants uh, were due for an irrigation at the time we cultivated. Uh, so they were a little bit on the dry side. Um, we had an adjacent border that we cultivated a week early uh, with the same setup, um, and we didn't see this kind of uh, injury. So there's a interaction between root pruning and the amount of moisture in the soil profile in terms of seeing this kind of injury. But it is something that we have to, to keep in mind. <clears throat> All right, so uh, I'm going to start at the end to tell you what a program for weed control looks like. Um, basically, it's critical that we start the season with a pre-emergence herbicide, Prowl H2O. We apply in the sandy loam soils, we apply this at two pints in the clays. We can go up to three pints per acre per, as per the label. So typically, we'll apply this uh, uh, on a flat field incorporated with a field, corporate, field uh, cultivator. And uh, then of course, go through the standard process for making beds, listing, mulching, uh, bed shaping. And we'll direct seed as Sam indicated. And then um, as those plants reach the four true leaf growth stage in this particular field that I've got a screenshot of, um, we, we thought we were at four leaf. Most of the plants had four leaves, but when we went in and uh, rigorously counted, uh, did leaf counts on a lot of leaves in our control plots, we found we were actually closer to three leaf than four leaf. So they were in that three to four leaf range. So we spray with an ounce and a half of AIM. We followed that a few days later uh, with Fusilade. We find we can't tank mix those two materials without getting antagonism between the herbicides and reducing weed control. Uh, the AIM application injures, does injure the plants, uh, as I'll show you later, um, but they recover. And uh, by the time they reach the 10 leaf growth stage, those plants that we, the weeds that we sprayed with AIM the first time around that didn't die uh, need to be sprayed again. And then of course, the more seedling, more weed seedlings uh, may have emerged. So we need to spray a second time. In this particular case, we did it about 10 leaves. And then a few days later, we applied a prowl uh, at a four pint per acre rate and then irrigated to in incorporate it. Of course, that doesn't give us incorporation on the bed top since we're furrow irrigating, but um, it does provide significant weed control. In retrospect, we kind of got that wrong uh, and we followed it. Later on, because of weeds, we did cultivate uh, after that prowl application. In retrospect, 
uh, we probably needed to reverse the order of the cultivation and the, and the prowl application for maximum uh, efficacy. And then where we're going next with uh, future research is uh, we need to look at uh, lay-by type uh, applications um, on established Waiuli, uh, you know, with a hooded sprayer uh, or a direct, just directed nozzles. So that's what we'll be working on in the, on the future. So this gives you an idea of what's going to be required to get the crop established. Um, now I'm going to back up and talk about um, some data that we've collected on, on this, this use pattern. So basically our experiment procedure was we, we would start with a field. We, we in, in many, most cases, we apply Prowl, Preplant Incorporated, or one of the other uh, herbicides that we were studying. Uh, then we form beds. And then potentially after we form beds, we can also spray uh, pre-emergence herbicides and incorporate it on the bed top, either with sprinkler irrigation or, or uh, a machine that I'll show you a picture of in a moment. And then we direct seed and then we irrigate um, typically every other furrow uh, recently in the last several years, but we have worked with uh, sprinklers. So center pivots could be an effective irrigation method for Wiley pr production. Um, when we do furrow irrigate, we water every other furrow and it takes, uh, you know, you have to irrigate frequently to get the seed germinated three to four times uh, with the furrow irrigation scenario. We've got to try to keep it usually spaced uh, two days apart. You've got to keep that seed line on the bed top moist during the germination uh, period of first five, six days or so um, in order to get a good stand uh, established. This is the uh, machine that we uh, use to incorporate herbicides on the bed top. It's basically just a pair of rolling cultivators uh, mounted um, offset from one another. So first you throw the soil in one direction and then back the other uh, uh, back the other way. And it's quite effective on incorporating our herbicide treatments into the top uh, in one to two inches of, of the so soil profile. And then depending on the soil texture, you can either use the roller on the back of the machine or, or not. This is just a picture of uh, Kind of establishment we we hope to get. Uh, picture on the left is is uh, taken at Bridgestone's farm in a clay loam. Uh, we generally get a, a nice stand because the clay retains moisture better uh, in the furrow irrigated system. At Maricopa Ag Center, where we have a sandy loam soil, um, we don't get quite as good of stand established, but we still get plenty of seeds, uh, plenty of plants per foot of row to. Um, be able to do our experience and, and establish a good experiments and establish a good crop. So basically, when we collect data, we, we these are this all this herbicide work has done it been done uh, in small plots, and in each plot, which is typically four rows uh, wide by 30 to 40 feet, depending on the, on the nature of the study, we'll take the data out of the center two rows um, as shown here. Um, usually a, a two meter subplot in, in two rows. And um, although we're spraying all four rows with, with a treatment, and then we'll work to keep this subplot area hand weeded so that we, we don't have competition effects affecting our, from weeds affecting our data collect, our uh, data results. Uh, it's just some nozzle we use to spray. Kind of data that we collect are stand counts. So we'll count the number of plants per two meters in those subplots uh, to see what's emerged and, and following post-emergence applications, what potentially has died. We will take visual estimates of phytotoxicity based on necrosis and studying, stunting. Uh, when the plants get bigger, we'll measure plant heights. When the plants are small, as shown in this picture here on the right, we'll use a NADAR photographs, or, which are simply photographs taken looking straight down on the ground um, to, uh, and then analyze that uh, digitally so that we can basically count up all the pixels that uh, represent green plants. We've used both a program called Easy Leaf and more recently Canopio um, to do that, we can determine percent ground canopy ground cover per meter of crop row. We can also calculate centimeters squared of canopy per meter row. 
and centimeters per plant. We, we do this we can do this because we use a red calibration square in many of the pictures so we know we know the area of the square so we know the the number of pixels per centimeter squared. So that's the nature of the data that we collect. So I'm going to just show you some data for Prowl H2O that we collected at the Maricopa Ag Center over the course of a couple of years and I have several graphs like this so I'll set this up um, on the y-axis. We have Waiuli population in terms of number of plants per meter of row, crop row. On the x-axis, we have the days after treatment, um, in other words, after herbicide application, uh, that we conducted the counts at. Across the top in the legend, we've got the rates of um, herbicide and pounds active ingredient per acre. So 0.95 pounds active ingredient per acre of Prowl H2O is, is uh, two pints. And then you can see the color coding for the, the different rates. So this top line here is our control plots. And th these are the various increasing rates of Prowl. And you can see in this particular case where we sprayed the herbicide on the bed top, planted the seed, and then turned the sprinklers on to incorporate the herbicide, we had a pretty big impact on our plant population from the different rates of the herbicide. And this was coupled with a, a cold, uh, cold snap in the fall of 2018 that uh, the combination of the, the cold and the, and the herbicide uh, caused a, a, a lot of uh, plant loss. Oops. Um, so this makes sense from the standpoint that the herbicide is concentrated near the bed top um, right in the seed zone. So those Waiuli roots are growing through, uh, trying to grow through that herbicide treated soil. If we incorporated the prowl on the flat and then made the beds so that the herbicide is distributed through the soil profile of the bed, you can see that we had essentially no effect of the herbicide rate on um, plant population. And this, 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 uh, treatment was sprinkler irrigated just like this treatment was. In 2019, we furrow irrigated and we compared applying the herbicide on the bed top and incorporating it with that incorporation machine. Um, and you can see there was some, wasn't a significant effect of, of the herbicide rate on our stand counts. And we compared that with applying the herbicide on the flat. We had an issue though that led to an interesting result in that in this portion of the field, we lost, uh, we lost the crop and we had to replant. And what I did is, is we went out on those beds, stale beds from the first planting, and we just sprayed a half rate of the herbicide treatments. And then we mulched them and used a disc hipper and, and then bed shaped to reestablish the beds. And then we planted Waiuli and furrow irrigated every other row. And you can see uh, it, the uh, number in the parentheses is the actual total amount of herbicide, amount of prowl that was applied. And you can see there's a pretty good uh, trend of uh, stand loss versus increasing rate of uh, prowl. So that, that makes that makes sense. Uh, we do need to observe, uh, you know, adjust our herbicide rate to the nature of the soil. All right, so that uh, gives you a sense of why we feel that prowl is, is going to be safe to use with uh, with Wiley. I would just also comment that uh, similar studies were done in the clay loam at Mac, or excuse me, in Eloy, at the Bridgestone farm. And uh, in, in those studies, regardless of whether we sprinkler irrigated, uh, how the herbicide was incorporated, because of that heavier soil type, uh, we, we didn't see any stand loss from uh, any of the treatments. Real quickly, I'll just show you that uh, an example, dual magnum is a herbicide that we feel we can use on the bed top um, and incorporated either with sprinklers or with mechanical incorporation. And we, we have not seen any effect of, of herbicide rate on our stand counts um, 
in our with any of our experiments in either Eloy or at the Maricopa Ag Center. So dual is a is one of the ones that we're working to obtain a label for, um, and I hope to get that accomplished this winter. And this is just the 2019 data um, showing it where we incorporated it on the bed top versus where we incorporated it on the flat. Um, <clears throat> So now I want to, so in conclusion, uh, we found that both metolachlor, uh, which is dual, and sulfetrazone, which is Spartan, are safe up to 2x rate on Waiuli, and we can use them, uh, <coughs> apply them in several different ways on both sandy loams and clay soils. With acetochlor, which is warrant, or benzolate, which is prefar, they're safe when incorporated. Uh, they, you can they can't, Wiley can tolerate a, a, an over-label rate and you still get a stand, but there is some, uh, potentially some stand loss, less so with, with uh, PREFAR. Um, and then ethafluralin, which is Sonaland, performs similarly to PROW, and I think we just went through that. So I'm gonna skip on to our, my next topic, which is um, there's always going to be escape, weed escapes from our pre-emergent herbicide applications, so we do need some post-emergent herbicides. This is just a picture of a study uh, done in the spring of uh, 2018 at Eloy, um, which I'm going to discuss, show you some data from. And this is just a, one of the plots. This happens to be a plot um, with one of the higher rates of AIM. We used a TGIT turbo TJ uh, flat fan nozzle. So we put out medium droplets and got good spray coverage, which we need for any kind of burn down chemistry like the PPOs. We did an experiment where we planted the field and then we sprayed AIM at different leaf growth stages, which is shown in the left-hand column of this table. And I've listed the spray dates for each of these uh, different plant sizes. And then on July 11th, we went in and counted all the plants in each plot. And I've listed here the number of days after treatment for those counts. And in this slide, I'm showing you on the y-axis is the rate of AIM in ounces per acre. On the x-axis is the number of uh, seedlings per meter of row. And up here on the left of each graph is the, the leaf plant size in terms of true leaves at each of the, for each of the growth stages uh, that we sprayed. If you focus on just one bar, say for example, a four ounce rate on two leaf Waiuli, the total length of the, oops, the total length of the bar, both the, the filled in and the open bar, these are the number of seedlings we had um, uh, prior to spraying and the dark portion of the bar represents the number of seedlings we had after the spring. You can see it two true leaves. We did have a loss of plants um, at the higher rates, particularly above two ounces per acre. And that, that effect pretty much disappears by the time you get to uh, close to four true leaves. And as the plants get larger, as you would expect, there was no impact. Um, no, no loss of seedlings due to that spray. Now that doesn't mean there was an injury. And if we look at this table, we have um, days, we have uh, the rate of aim and we have the days after treatment, we made the measurement. Here's the two leaf plants and the, and the 3.6 true leaf plants. And this is the centimeter squared per meter of a centimeter squared of canopy per meter of row that we had after the spray. And here's the control number down here. So you can see we substantially injured these plants, but they did regrow. And uh, just to show you a quick picture here, here you can see a seedling that we killed with the AIM application at two fluid ounces. And if you look at these plants carefully, you can see that there's leaf burn on the older leaves but these plants are on the way to growing out of the uh, injury. And when we look at these plants, um, here's the four different growth stages that we sprayed at. These numbers are the plant heights, 
compared to the untreated check. And you can see that in the rate range of one to two ounces, so this region in here, we don't see um, any significant effects on um, long-term effects on those Waiuli plants. Excuse me, Bill, I just want to pop in here while you're switching slides and say that it's 1044 and we're hoping to give people a break before we start up again at 11 with uh, Peter Ellsworth's presentation. Right, so I'm just about done. So here's our summary for the carfentrazone. Uh, you do get injury. The injury increases with carfentrazone rate, the aim rate. Uh, we do get some stand loss and stunting. Um, that injury decreases with plant size. So uh, Yuli can easily tolerate, when it's larger, uh, sequential applications because the plants do grow out of injury. So the use rate of one to two ounces is where we need to be. And then um, I'll, I'll end with this table of tactics for Wiley weed control. And I would just start by emphasizing that we don't wanna put this new crop in your worst field on your farm where you've got a lot of weeds. You wanna, you wanna um, put it in a field where you've been managing those weeds over the period over a period of years so it's and why leaves not going to get overwhelmed we have to use a pre-emergence herbicide we can spray the grass herbicides whenever we need to typically starting at two true leaves on the waiuli um, we can spray aim when the leaf waiuli has four true leaves we can carefully cultivate um, and then later in the season we can apply some herbicides uh, post-emergence over the top and irrigate them in and with that, I'm done. Excellent. Thanks, Bill. Uh, so could you briefly go over what is already labeled and what will be, a lab or what will be labeled soon and, and when, when soon means? Um, well, I'm working with the companies and getting, getting um, data submitted to the ADA and Jack Peterson uh, to go through the special local leads um, needs um, <clears throat> process uh, does take time, but that is something that we hope to accomplish so that over this winter. We already have labels for Prowl, AIM, Fusillade, and Paraquat, although Paraquat's really, um, we can't spray Paraquat on Waiuli without killing the uh, seedlings, uh, but it has other uses when the plants are larger. Um, and we're working to get uh, labels for some of these other herbicides like Dual and Spartan over the course of this winter, as well as a couple of the other grass herbicides. So I hope that by next spring, uh, we have some additional labels. Excellent. And then we just got a question came in about uh, what you've seen for uh, germination time or uh, planting to emergence time on this direct seeded crop. Uh, well, for example, this spring, uh, it was about five to six days. It can be, of course, it was very warm this spring. Uh, in a fall planting, it, it might be a day longer, maybe two days max. It's going to depend on soil temperatures. Yeah, I've seen similar things. It germinates fairly quickly, but we got to keep water on it. Yeah. 